want to talk to you about raising royalty, all right? And the concept of today's message is that every one of you are royalty, but your children are royalty. And you have to realize that. And when you begin to understand the significance of the life of your son or your daughter is so valuable in the hands of God that uh, it can change your perspective. It really can. It can really alter the way you look at the future with your children if you just look at them with the mindset that they really are royalty, but they have to be brought into it. And so my opening scripture is going to come from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. And it's out of the Passion Translation. And I, and I, and I listen, this is, I'm going to read you the scripture in a moment, but I'm going to give you just a, a hint of a background. Uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church in the second letter. Theologians believe that Paul, in between one and two, wrote another letter that the Lord didn't allow into the scriptures. And that second letter was really a pretty... A uh, hard word being spoken to the Corinthian church about the condition of the church. This is what the theologians believe. But so Paul writes in these writings, he says, I sent you these letters not to discourage you or to hurt you, but to bring joy to you that you might bring me joy. Does that make sense? Well, I'm reading it like that, and I'm like, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, Paul's being a good papa. You know, Paul's being a good daddy. But then I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, but look at it again. And remember, I'm writing this to you. It's me to you. And I came across this statement where, where Paul writes, but the Holy Ghost is saying, he says, if I brought you pain, you would be unable to bring me joy. And so the context is this, is that most people believe that the Lord allows pain things to happen to us to correct us or keep us in order. But, the, but God is saying, if I'm the one who brings you pain, then you, if, if I brought you pain, you would be unable. Think about this. If I brought you pain, you would be unable. And the end result is to bring me joy. So the end result of this is that God has a desire to bring for your life to bring him joy. So as a father, Father God is making a confession to you. I do not bring you pain, but I'm enabling you to bring me joy. That your life brings me joy. Well, when you look at it from the perspective of being a father, if that's how father treats us, then that's how you are to approach your kids. I don't approach my kids to bring them pain. I'm bringing discipline or insight to their life so that their lifespan can bring me joy. Amen. Now I hope that all of you realize that you are not a product of your own creation. You are a product of generations past that has culminated in you present with Jesus now. All right, there is some Jesus. And I'm going to show you something in, in just, uh, hopefully today we can get to it, where David was so intent on following the heartbeat of God Almighty that God Almighty treated generations of David's followers good. Ultimately, Jesus was the culmination of God's goodness to mankind. But it started off with David, who had a heart who chased after the will of God. And because he chased after the will of God, one man changed the destiny for generations yet to come. So when I look back and I think about my personal life, I know that my mother comes from a family where her daddy died when she was a young girl. And I can remember my mom, well, going to my grandmother's home, and as a child, remembering my grandmother, uh, in whatever age she was at that time, every morning would go to church and have her morning mass and prayer time. And then she would come home early morning. Am I correct, Mama? All right. What's significant about that was that back then, her, there's no doubt, she was in a position where she had no husband, had no provider. I mean, in that day, there was no alternative resources, like Elman said a moment ago. You had to trust God to feed your family. So she'd go to church, and she'd see God. And she came home and she managed, after the death of her husband, which t totally they raised 12 kids together. So whatever children were left back in the house, my grandmother needed Jesus more than anybody. And you know what's cool about it? Jesus provided. But out of that seeking God, my mom came to faith. My mom came to a place where she fell in love with Jesus, which was a little bit higher than what mama had. 
But mama started off seeking God. And then mama came to faith. Mama then introduced Jesus to her family, which then at that time, none of us were ready for Jesus to come into our family. But yet she stayed persistent, and now her whole family's born again. So you can see this progressive increase of the kingdom of God by somebody seeking the face of God. So if I go back and think about my dad's side of the family, what I can recall more than anything is my grandmother Gladys... She was a prayer warrior. I can take you into my office, and at the time of her death, there was a... Listen, she was a Catholic lady who loved Jesus, but understood something about faith, because in her purse was a confession of faith that was written out of what she was believing God for. It was written in her handwriting. I took that card, when I went because they were just going through stuff. You know, and it was in her purse. And I said, can I take that? They said, absolutely. It's just a card with mom's writing. No, I said, it's more than that. It's a, it's a statement of my grandmother's faith. It was written out as a confession card. So I got it in my office sitting in one of my things. And I put it on there the date I received it from my, the family. To, to be able to at one point show back to my kids that you and I didn't just arrive we're riding on the shoulders of people who sought God before us. And if you had never had anybody who sought God before you, start today. Amen. So that all of a sudden strips us of any type of, hey, 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 look how great I am. Hey, dude, you ain't squat. But the truth of the matter is, if you anything in life, it's because somebody, grandma, great-grandma, great-grandpa, <laughs> sought Jesus, cried out for a future, and all of a sudden he impacted. So all of a sudden right here, man, I didn't bring you pain. I'm empowering you to bring me joy. So raising children then, what we ought to be doing as, 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 as parents, as friends to families, is that we raise children where our heart is moving towards royal responsibilities. In other words, my heart is being moved by God, influenced by the Holy Ghost, moving me to this royal responsibility to search for Him, to know Him, so that I can reflect Him to them, so that their heart will be moved to their royal responsibilities before Him. So there's this cultural change that takes place in the life of the believer, but all of it produces something. It produces confidence in God. You remember David started off after the anointing of God came upon his life, but we know this, that, that those people taught their children the testimonies of the Lord. And this young man took the testimonies of the Lord, he went out and watched his father's sheep, and he exercised the truth of that word, but within himself. And, and then when the anointing of God, was anoint, when he was anointed to be king, and the anointing came on him, he was a different man, and he went out to the field to watch over the, the, the sheep, and and the lion and the bear showed up. This is how it appears to me. They show up. He slays them. He gets more and more confidence in God. And before you know it, when a, when a Goliath shows up, he, not only does he at one point deliver the sheep from the lion and the bear, now he delivers a nation. Amen. That's the increase of confidence. You see, you just never know where you're going to end up at. Amen. Today you're slaying lions and bears. But tomorrow you may take down a stronghold that will set a whole city free. And so the whole thing about confidence in God is about getting our babies to understand they have a God-given destiny. And the only way they can get it is by pursuing the influence of God on their heart. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 1 there's this question that comes to Samuel the prophet. So let's look at Samuel the prophet as being the, the mom or the dad. They're just stuck in life. Like, so Samuel for a moment, he's mourning that, that, that God has chosen another king instead of Saul. And, and Samuel is moved. He's, just, he's not moving forward. And so I would say like this, how long will you stay stuck, mom or dad? How long are you going to mourn over the present condition? Why are you satisfied with the status quo of your family? 
He tells them, fill your horn with oil. That means bear some responsibility. Get away with the Lord. He's telling Samuel, move away from me. Go to the tabernacle where the oil is reserved. Get your personal vessel. Fill it with oil. Fill your vessel with oil. I have an assignment for you. Mom and dad, why are you stuck in the past of your family's legacy? You have the opportunity to change the future. But it's going to require you to get away and get your horn, your personal vessel, filled with the anointing of God, His presence. Why? So that you can go. You can go where He sends you. And He's sending you to a place where He provides for Himself a king amongst the children. You see, when all these young boys and girls go to youth group, they go to children's church room, group or church in the rooms, we just like, whew, we're free. Folks, that group of kids are just as anointed of God to impact the nations as any of you are. Their future can be brighter than our future because of the legacy that we can set for them that they can carry on before us, beyond us. I mean, the future is glorious. But if we don't start seeing that parenting, grandparenting, befriending the family and the children is a royal responsibility, man, we really miss it. Can you imagine what would take place in the life of a kid if, if moms and dads and grandparents raised their children with godly dignity? If you raise kids with grace instead of the letter of the law, if you, if you raise your kids in an atmosphere of humility, if you raise your kids where they were aware that the kingdom of God was filled with resources available to them, if you raise them like that, can you imagine the potential of today's society, of the church? But we just raise them to be normal. Get them through school. Just pass your test, baby. There's no concept about, can you see the angels in this room? We think that's weird. Can, do you know of heaven's provision for you? Are you living aware that there's a greater world out there that's living in among us than what we know? And it's available if you can only transcend yourself out of this natural and go by faith to take hold of what's before you. He said, well, that's kind of, I don't even understand that. Right. That's why we bear this royal responsibility to first discover it so we can pass it on. Yeah. If you're not willing, as I encourage my own daughter, to say, look, don't be stuck in feeling bad. Why don't you draw close to him by making him big in your life by praising him? Make him big in your life by acknowledging how big he is. Because if you don't, you're going to get a grasshopper mindset in the face of your giant. I can't overcome this sickness. Jesus already overcame the sickness. Enter into his presence. I can't overcome the grief and the loss of my life. Jesus already won the victory over grief and loss. But you got to get out of this grasshopper mindset. Because the moment your enemies become bigger than your God, the enemy is your God. Man, may I become aware of kingdom resources so I can teach it to my babies. And it's just not good for me, it's good for everybody. Do you understand what will happen to your life and my life if we come into kingdom resources that we can just excessively give away? I'm not talking about tangible stuff only. What about when you're struggling in life and you press into His presence and the presence of the Lord comes and He comforts you? The Bible says that God, the Father of all comfort, 
comes to comfort you so that when you leave this place of comfort and you walk outside of your house into the streets of life, there's going to be somebody that you can bring the comfort of the comforter to those who have need of comfort. You just introduce them to Jesus. You're a bearer of the comforter. Psalm 78, verse 5 and 8. I want to tell you, I, I missed a word here, so I want you to read through with me. But he says, remember this, that he established written instructions. And he gave his, and that's supposed to be teachings right after that. So it's missing in my notes. So he gave us instructions. He gave us teachings so that we can make them known to our children. So that the next generation would know them. So children, even yet to be born, can learn the principles of God. And then I love this statement, and they will grow up. They will grow up. They will grow up. They will grow up. Somebody say amen. amen. They will grow up. Amen. And they're going to teach their babies. Amen. And they're going to teach their babies. They're going to teach them, trust the Lord. They're going to remember what he did for you. Yeah. And they're going to remember what he did for them. And he's going to teach it to their kids. And they're going to obey the commands. And they will not be like preceding generations who were stubborn and rebellious. Yeah. Woo! Man, the future is glorious. Yeah. He says, tell your stories. And he's going to transform the heart of the future. Right. Yeah. What a great promise. Tell your kids the truth of your relationship with a living God. And God will keep your children from being stubborn and rebellious. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but God created every human being for leadership. Even these little tights that are running around here. Every child in this city was born for leadership. They were born for royal responsibility. That's what I mean by leadership. And they were born to govern something, to manage something, to bring God's goodness somewhere, somehow, to somebody. To deliver the broken, to deliver the hurting, to elevate people's lives. That's why we're here. Everybody, starting with you, were born with divine destiny in, at hand. And it's time that we know that. Let me give you an example. 1 Samuel chapter 16. He said, Pastor, why do we keep going back to 1 Samuel 16? That's where David is. Before he ever was going to slay a giant, you've got to see that there was a prophet who was mourning the loss of a king. But God had another one lined up. God always has a stack of people ready to move. And they're in our sons and daughters. So he tells Samuel, I'm going to show thee what to do. That's leadership. That's royal responsibility. That's somebody who knows the presence of the Lord, who is seeking the counsel of God and the influence of heaven over their heart. He says, so if you do that, I'm going to show you what to do. And he says, but you, you, mom, you, dad, you, friend of the family, you shall anoint for the Lord a king that I'm going to show you his name. And the Bible says, which I think is so significant, Samuel did what the Lord spoke. Amen. See, when we were growing up, I always had this impression about my kids. And I always told them, I said, Leah, I see, and this is as a kid, I said, you're going to have a kiss of God on your life to create wealth. God's going to bless you in that realm of life. Now, you know there's certain things that just come naturally. KK, uh, we've all seen the dynamics of that motherhood, just that motherly state of being. 
and all of a sudden, you know, her life has always been around kids, and, and even today her life is in, Leah's in the money world, and Kayla's in the kid world, and we've always seen Chrissy. Chrissy, as a young little girl, we took her the first time, you take her to a mission strip, she's sitting on the, on the floor, and she's trying to teach kids how to play fish, and then starts giving away all of her clothes. And you say, hmm, so this one might have ministry in her. So today, she stands up and she sings the songs of the Lord. Where did all that start? You think, well, that's all coincidence. Really? Seems to me it's exactly what he said. He says, you anoint them. You speak into them. You decree a thing to them. You set their life in order. And watch them come to pass. I have a king among you. I have priests among you. I have ministers of God among you. Tell them who they are. Now, I don't finalize the decisions, you know. I mean, the Holy Ghost has got a lot to do with that. But you as a parent can see stuff. Right. Tell them. Connect them to Jesus. It's important. So moms and dads, grandparents, friends of the family, all of us are tools to God's eternal destiny. We have the availability to shape values, to develop character, to, to bring out giftings in their lives. We get the ability to alter thought life in the next generation if we will do it right. We have the responsibility of raising up another generation of royal dignitaries. Yeah. Yeah. Whew, Jesus. Man, I love the fact that our kids are positioned by God. They're positioned by God to represent Him with courage in a generation where Christians are afraid. Afraid to stand up for truth. Afraid of knowing what's truth. I don't know if this is right or wrong. But you're equipped to raise your kids to know what's right from wrong. And to love people and to respect people and to honor people, but to stand for truth. Amen. You know what happens though? Because I've seen it with all of my girls in school. My girls weren't mean. They weren't ugly. They were always voted top of the class. They were voted. They got so many awards for being excellent kids. But to do that, you get persecuted. You get made fun of because you're different. And your light that you reflect is a different color than everybody else's light. And then you got to teach your kids. It's okay, baby. On the other end, some point in life, those people are going to need you. And you're going to have the answer for their life. So I would think that all of us then can understand why this is important. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. So Samuel takes the horn of oil and he anoints David. He deposits what's in him into David. In the midst of his brothers. In the front of everybody. He tells them who he is. And the Bible says when he anointed him, he obeyed the voice of the Lord. He took what God had put in him and put it on David. That the spirit of the Lord came upon David. And it was from that day forward. Now, what was significant about that? Well, theologians write, from that moment on, what came upon David was not that he was distinguishable among anybody else as much as it was this. The Spirit of God came upon him with the spirit of prophecy. Now that kid, a young man, could now prophesy what God was saying because the prophet had given him what he had. The reason that I know my kids can preach the gospel is because we put it in them. And all of them experience it, but Caleb behind the pulpit. But that doesn't mean she ain't going to preach the gospel. She preaches the gospel all the time with her work on the internet and what she does. But she teaches the baby. But the point being is that they got it in them. How you, how you got it in it? Because we, de we deposited in them, them. So David got the spirit of prophecy. Then he became exalted in rank. And I can prove that to you in a little while, but I don't think I can today because the time is gone. But from that point on, he walked in the spirit of wisdom and with prudence. And he was then capable, because of the spirit of God, to now govern. The spirit of God positioned him to govern. You say, why is that important? Because every generation needs a leader. And it's the spirit of God on your life 
in your life that will be deposited in your kids that will incapable, will empower them to govern their generation. But if they don't know that they're empowered by God to govern their generation, they'll be just another body in a generation. So I think all of us can understand this, that if we're going to be men and women of God, we have to really humbly seek God's provision for our life. It takes prayer. It takes relationship. And so let me, let me conclude with this thought, <clears throat> and then we'll pick it up again next week. Is that okay? I have, I have faith to believe because I... I don't know. I, I'm just going to be transparent with you. I mean, this morning, um, I'm, in, I'm in my office, and these things are rolling through me. And there's a natural tendency for all of us to think that at some point in life, I've achieved what I've achieved because of how wonderful I am in my walk with Jesus. But in the midst of the teaching, you realize, man, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants who went before me. I mean, spiritual giants, not bad giants, you know, not Goliath giants, but Jesus giants. He said, well, <clears throat> well, they didn't know as much as you do. Yeah, but they had to rely on God in a different way than I had to. They sought God for things that I, I you know, I, I don't know what it is to be a woman without a husband um, who, who has to make a living off of a snowball stand. I don't know what that's like. But her prayers propelled me to a place I don't have to. <laughs> her crying out to a living God that God would feed her children as fed my mama's children. And then my mama's faith took her from where she was, seeing a mama having to go over there to believe God for money to supply, to feed her kids. And then she took that faith into her house that propelled her to create this generation. And now this generation is creating that generation. And it's just getting better and better. It's leading to nothing but good yeah. and better. <clears throat> so I believe that the blessing of God chases down those who go after his purposes. And that should be the cornerstone of all behavior. Moms and dads, that should be the cornerstone of raising royal dignitaries. The cornerstone of behavior is that our children need to know they have to chase down the purposes of God for their own life. Psalms chapter 23 is going to be the last scripture that we look at. And it says this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though, though I walk through difficulties in life, I will not fear. I will fear no evil. Why? Because there's an awareness of divine destiny because you are with me. There's this place in life where you learn, I have nothing to be afraid of because I have divine destiny working for me. You stand up in front of your kids and you say, do you know that there was a time in my life where the doctor said you were going to die? You know, there's a time in life where the doctors told mom and I, you weren't going to make it. But we got aside and we called on the name of the Lord and he showed up and he delivered you from all evil. Don't tell me that Jesus doesn't love you. You need to know that God loves you enough that he spared you, he delivered you. Amen. And at that point, it brings faith where they can stand up and say, you know what? There's a time where the devil tried to take my life. But I'm alive today. You see, you lying devil, I will not be afraid of you because the Lord resides with me. Yeah. And that's, that's what happens when the kids start getting it. Goes to a whole nother level. That's why David is a young man who's now speaking out of experience. I'm not afraid of nothing. The Lord's with me because his rod, his commandments, his staff, his teachings, they comfort me and they keep me. And then he goes on, because I have his commands, because I've got the teachings of the Lord, because I know that I'm safe. This is the look. This is faith made alive. Thou hast prepared before me a table in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy 
chased me down every day of my life. And I forever will dwell in the house of the Lord, my God. And that comes out of experience. Don't tell me that God won't reward you for chasing him, him down. It just won't be in this life. It's going to be in generations yet to come where you don't figure out what did all that stuff have to do? Going to church, and I understand it was good for me, but what was it really all about? And you'll stand up before the Lord and say, because you sought after me. Look at the generations of harvest that's come out of your faithfulness to me. So I believe kingdom authority is given to those who will seek him. And seeking his outcome represents his nature, his heart, and represents his kingdom. Go after Jesus, church. Go after Jesus, moms and dads. And then bring it to your babies and pour it out all over them. My mama, when she first started, we all thought she was nuts. It was so awkward for mama to talk to me about Jesus. Nobody talked to me like that before. I'm so glad mama talked to me about Jesus. I'm so glad mama stood her ground and deposited what God put in her. Some of you got grandparents that talk to you about Jesus and they deposited in you and you're now a forerunner to their life. And now you're, you're preceding your kids. This is important stuff, folks. So everybody say, I'm raising royalty. I'm raising royalty. Now you say, well, I ain't got no kids, but you got a lot of friends who do. You can be a part of royalty all you want if you choose to be. You can be isolated and say, well, I'm single. You know, I want to tell you something. Uh, Tina Boudreaux, single girl, uh, friend of the family. She's been helping. She's helped us raise my kids. <coughs> When Leah was struggling in life, she was going through some hard times in life. She wanted out of Thibodeau. She wanted nothing to do with us in life. God intercepted her with a Tina Boudreau. Yeah. Boom. Put them together in Baton Rouge. Yes, Lord. And my girl came home. So you don't have to just be a mom and a dad. Sometimes you just got to be a friend. So if you're sitting here and you're like, I'm single. I can't, this doesn't relate to me. You're so wrong. We need you. I need you to be a friend of my family. I need you to be a friend of my grandkids. All right, stand up. Or I'm just going to keep on going. 